Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. If we can ask everyone to come back, inshallah, so that Sheikh Tim can start his uh, dars. Um, okay, a few announcements before we uh, commence. Uh, some people are still asking regarding books. Inshallah, after uh, we, we, have, we have two sessions with uh, Ustad Tim, inshallah. Uh, after his first session, uh, which will finish approximately quarter to uh, ten, inshallah, we're going to have a break. During that break, the books will be sold in the same place as uh, yesterday, uh, inshallah. So those that want the books can get the books uh, during that break. Secondly, there have been a few complaints about people talking during the lessons. So please, please, please do not talk during the lessons. If you want to talk, then please go outside. Um, okay, so that you're not disturbing others. Right? You know, sometimes it could be an emergency, it could be whatever reason, no problem whatsoever. But please do so uh, outside so that you're not disturbing others. Likewise, um, you know, Alhamdulillah, the Masjid is giving out tea and so on. And you can drink it in here because I understand the breaks are always the longest to finish it. However, please look after your, your rubbish. Right? Look after the cups, keep them with you, throw them into the bins. Don't just leave them lying around. And some people leave the cups lying around with, with, with tea in it. So if they're left there around, somebody's walking, he doesn't realize it's there, what's going to happen? You know, it's going to mess up the, the coffee, right? So please uh, keep that in mind as well. Also another thing, uh, a complaint I received last night regarding some of the brothers who were staying over, which is that they were talking too much during the night. And even when they were told or you know, asked nicely by other brothers to please stop talking, they were basically you know, trying to mock a brother for asking him uh, and so on. And this, honestly, if you are doing that, in the masjid, during a door of seeking Islamic knowledge, then that knowledge has not benefited you one single bit. The Prophet ﷺ, he used to dislike sleeping before Isha, and he used to dislike talking after Isha. Unless it's, you know, something, need uh, something beneficial like a dars or something. Just talking was disliked. So imagine you are doing something disliked, something for Prophet this you know, dislike, not straight after Isha, way after Isha. And on top of that, you're doing that in the masjid, and you shouldn't be talking in the masjid. You know the hadith of Umar, where he said to the people like, if you, who were talking loudly in the masjid, if you went from around here, uh, sorry, if you went from Ta'if and you were from Medina, you know, I would have sorted you out for talking too loud in the masjid. And then on top of that, you're disturbing others. Now, dirt finishes at 11 p.m., it's late. Brothers, you know, they want to sleep so that they can wake up fresh uh, in the morning for the Fajr class. Brothers were complaining that we were feeling sleepy in the Fajr class because brothers were speaking loudly at night and they did not allow us to sleep. And I'm going to be very strict. If I get this complaint, I don't live far, I just live a minute walk. I'm going to come and whoever's disturbing others, we're not going to let you sleep in the masjid. It's going to kick you out. Okay, it's not fair on the brothers who are trying to sleep, brothers who have come from far. Some brothers have traveled 10 hours on a bus just to get here and so on. And there might be 50, 60, 70 people sleeping here. It just takes a group of two or three excited brothers to ruin the whole night for everybody else. So please take that into consideration. None of you truly believe until you look for your brother or you look for yourself. And you've heard some of my announcements that I'm making. I'm not just making of these announcements. These are people coming to us complaining. So imagine you're sleeping, you're seeking Islamic knowledge and you're doing actions like this. Well, it's you know, it's not, uh, it's not befitting for a student of knowledge to be these, doing these type of things. Otherwise, you're spending 10 hours here, and be, and be, be honest, uh, you're just wasting that knowledge. Okay, what did, uh, who, who it was, one of the speakers talked about the importance of? Al-amul bil-ilm, acting upon that knowledge. So please, brothers, take that into, into uh, consideration. Jazakallah uh, khair. And without any delay, I'll pass it over to uh, Sheikh. Barakallah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala abdillahi wa rasulih Nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een Amma ba'd So first of all It is uh, from the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala That he brought us together again I say again because I've seen many of you here before And some new faces But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us here and gathered us here in a house from the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to study this religion to learn about it and to come near to Allah through 
beneficial knowledge and righteous action. And we need to understand that the Prophet ﷺ was sent with these two things. He is the one who sent the Prophet ﷺ with Al Huda, which in the language means guidance, and Deen Al Haq, the religion of truth. The meaning of these two things, Al Huda, is Al Ilm, Al Nafi', beneficial knowledge, and Deen Al Haq is Al Amal, Al Salih, righteous actions. Our religion combines between these two things. And my brothers, we're going to need this today because this is one of the fundamental principles that we're going to be studying in this book. That our religion combines between beneficial knowledge and righteous action. And whenever we bring beneficial knowledge and righteous action, this is the Siratul Mustaqim, which we ask Allah Azza wa Jal for a minimum of 17 times every single day. And that's a minimum, presuming you don't pray any Sunnah prayer or any Witr prayer or any Ratiba. In every single raka'ah of the prayer, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ihdina sirat al mustaqim. And what you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for is al ilm, al nafi' wal amal al salih. Beneficial knowledge and righteous action. That's why we came. We came intending, as Al Imam Ahmed was asked about the intention for seeking knowledge. And he said, An yanu ya rafa'a jahrin. He should make an intention to remove ignorance from himself and other people. And that encompasses both aspects of ignorance. Yani. That the person intends, ta'ala, they have the intention to increase in knowledge themselves and to benefit the people around them with that knowledge and the only way that you're going to do that is if you implement it and you put it into practice and it's sufficient for us to mention in this the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-Zumar أَمَّنْ هُوَ قَانِتٌ آنَاءَ اللَّيْلِ سَاجِدًا وَقَائِمًا يَحْذَرُ الْآخِرَةَ وَيَرْجُوا رَحْمَةَ رَبِّهِ قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الآيه Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said as for the one who is qanit as a fa'idah, a little benefit, the word qanit generally in the Qur'an, whenever it comes, it, it comes with the meaning of obedience. And all this is from the, any, the, the alfaz, any, the words of the Qur'an, which came with, a, with quite a consistent meaning wherever it comes in the Qur'an. And as for the one who is obedient throughout the night, Sajidan wa qa'ima, making sujood and standing in prayer. Yahdharu al akhirah, the person is scared of the hereafter. They're cautious of what will happen to them when they die. Wa yarju rahmata rabbih, and this person wants and hopes for the mercy of their Lord. That person has any description up to now been of their knowledge, it's all to do with what they act upon. They're standing in prayer, they fear the akhirah. And then Allah said, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Say, are those who know equal to those who don't know? So knowledge is not about how many books you have read. It's not about how much you memorized. Those are important. I think that's not the, the fundamental, if you like, yardstick by which we measure the knowledge we have. But we measure it by how much we implement. So we learn we practice, we teach other people, and we remain patient upon what happens to us as a result of those things. وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ The summary that we take from this surah is beneficial knowledge, righteous action, calling people and he's sharing that knowledge and action with other people and then being patient as a result of what happens to us when we do that. So inshallah ta'ala, that being said, we have in front of us a very, very important book 
from a very distinguished author. As for the author, he is Sheikh al Islam Taqiyuddin Abu Abbas, Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim ibn Abdul Salam, Mutaymiya al Harrani, Rahimahullah ta'ala rahmatan wasi'a. And there's very, very few people in the history of Islam in terms of any of the generations that passed that got this title, Sheikh al Islam. And it's not, an, it's not a title we give out very easily to people. Like in that title was given to Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala because this man gathered together so much knowledge of different sciences of Islam <coughs> that there's almost no science from the sciences of Islam except that he made a major contribution to it in his time. And we don't say that Sheikh al-Islam is better than those great imams that came before. Nor do we say that everything goes through the root of Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Yani everything that he says we take and everything that we, he tells us not to, we don't. Because in reality, we only have one imam like that. There's only one person. It's not Imam Ahmad. It's not Imam al-Shafi'i. It's not Imam Malik. It's not Imam Abu Hanifa. Rather, it's the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nobody else deserves that unreserved and absolute obedience other than him. And this is something Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah emphasizes many times. Ahlu Sunnah, they do not have a figure that they hold on to and they never leave except the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But he is, yani Shaykh Islam, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the great, great scholars of this ummah. That wallahi, even subhanAllah, people wrote, even they wrote, you know, uh, treaties and, and they wrote um, like theses and things like that about the topic of Sheikh Islam's contribution to any all different different kind of sciences within Islam and that's very unusual normally people specialize in one or two things they become famous for their knowledge of usul al-fiqh or they become not famous for their knowledge of fiqh or they become famous for their knowledge of hadith or they become famous for their knowledge of aqidah or and they, they could know all of them but they become famous and wallahi, he is a person that became famous for almost every single science within the sciences of Islam. For subhanAllah here, you can benefit a great deal from these and the writings of Shaykh al-Islam. Rahimahullah ta'ala. We have very limited time and the book is very long. It's 800 and something pages. So we're not going to be able to, so we set expectations. We won't be able to go through the entire book from beginning to end. But what I've tried to do is select some paragraphs just to highlight them and for us just to go over those and try to get a feeling for what the Sheikh is saying in the book. Rahimahullah ta'ala. The book he is entitled Iqtida'u Sirat al Mustaqim Mukhalafatu Ashab al Jahim. So the Sheikh here is talking about, first of all, let's break the title down. Let's first of all talk about As Sirat. Al-Mustaqim, the straight path. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the straight path in every raka'ah in the greatest surah of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Fatiha. In every single raka'ah we say to Allah, Hiddina Sirat Al-Mustaqim. After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after mentioning from His names and attributes and actions, and then asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to worship Him. All of that is focused upon a single request to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is to guide us to the straight path. That path, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it. فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّيقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا the people that Allah bestowed His favor upon, they are the prophets, those who are the most truthful in their iman, Siddiqeen, like Abu Bakr Siddiq, like Maryam ibn Imran, who Allah said about her, Wa ummuhu Siddiqah, 
any people who reach the highest level of truthfulness and completeness in their iman, in their faith. Was shuhada, the martyrs, was salihin, and the righteous. And what an excellent group of companions they are. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put us on that path. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. We ask Allah to keep us away from the paths of those who have gone astray, from those people that Allah's anger is upon, and those people who and have lost their way and have gone astray from their ignorance. And these two group of people, and these two groups of people, as Shaykh Islam is going to explain to us, Rahimullah Ta'ala, they are Al Yahud and Nasara. And that's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained them as. And that doesn't mean that the ayah is restricted to the Jews and Christians. But the Jews represent Al Maghdub Al Maghdubi alayhim and the Christians represent Al Dalu. Briefly, what is that for? We're going to go into the book. But the reason is, one of them, what is predominant from them, is that they had knowledge, but they didn't practice it. And that was mostly the problem of the Yahud. And that's what, we're not saying that's the only problem of them. But that is what was predominant. That's what took over. If you look at them, the thing that stands out is a people who had knowledge but didn't put that knowledge into practice. And if you were to look at the Nasara, the Christians, what is predominant from them is misguidance, ignorance, not knowing what's right and what's wrong, worshipping Allah upon ignorance. So the Yahud, they refused to worship Allah even though they had knowledge. And the Christians worshipped Allah without knowledge. And later, Shaykh Islam is going to say that this applies also to Al-Faris. It applies also to our Rome, yani please, to Persia and to the Romans also, the Byzantines. That they also fell into the same thing. So this ayah, it's not restricted to the Jews and Christians. But they are the primary example. People who had knowledge and didn't act upon it, and people who didn't have knowledge and worshipped Allah upon ignorance. So the Shaykh he speaks about iqtida al sirat al mustaqim. That there is something that this asking Allah for the straight path necessitates. And there is a meaning that is you have to accept it and you have to understand that when you ask Allah for the straight path what you, this entails and what this comprises is being different to those people the people of the hellfire and the entire book was established and written for this purpose to show you that by asking Allah for the straight path, what does that entail? What, what must happen? If you're asking Allah for the straight path and you ask Allah, do not make me upon the path of the people that earned your anger or the people who went astray, then by default, this entails and comprises that you make yourself different from those people. You separate yourselves from them you behave differently to them. This is what it entails. And this, as we're going to hear, is a fundamental principle and it's something that many people have lost the meaning of. Even in the time of Sheikh al-Islam, he says that many people lost the meaning of this and many people feel strange about it when you tell them that Islam came with the concept of being different to the people of the hellfire in every way that is possible. And the book is going to go into a lot of detail about the issues that are, where is it wajib or recommended, or where is it <coughs> permitted. And the issue of their celebrations 
In fact, the Shaykh al-Islam, rahimahullah ta'ala, from what he mentioned in his book, is that the original purpose behind the book was to clarify the ruling of celebrating the festivals of the non-Muslims or congratulating them in their festivals or being a part of their festivals. So it's a very appropriate time that we come together to read this book because we came any between two of their festivals that they celebrate, their Christmas and their New Year. Two of their festivals, their A'yad, and the word Eid, by the way, comes from, originally for the concept comes from A'da Ya'udu, something that comes back every, any regu- over a regular period of time, could be once a year, once a month, once, any, every now and again, it comes back. It's called an Eid. So there, two of their days of Eid. So it's very important that we understand that every time you ask Allah Azza wa Jal, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ you are asking Allah to make you different from these people and to have your own identity, your own behavior, your own characteristics that separates you from these people. And so the topic is extremely, extremely important. And inshallah ta'ala, as I said, we will not be able to read the entire book. Uh, primarily, we'll go over the explanation of Sheikh Ibn Thaymeen. He has some ta'liqat upon the book, Sheikh. Sheikh Muhammad Saleh al Uthaymeen, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he has some comments on the book. And he wrote some, or he was he, by audio, and then they wrote it as a book after that. Which is not very detailed, but he goes over it and he points things out. So we're going to benefit from that as well, inshallah Ta'ala. And as I said, we'll not be able to finish the entire book, but we'll try to take, first of all, what's most important are the principles that Sheikh Islam puts forward for us. It's very important that we understand his principles. And he, what is he basing this upon? And it's very important that we understand the default position that we have. Because remember, when you have things like principles and default positions, there's a great benefit in this for you because you know where should I start off. There are always going to be certain things where there might be a certain overlap between something we do and something that is done by Ahlul Kitab. It's not going to be the case that there is nothing that we do and they do will ever overlap. Even the Prophet wasallam, in the beginning, the Qibla that he faced, he faced Bayt al-Maqdis, the direction of Jerusalem, and then he turned to face Mecca and so on. So you're going to have areas there will be things in which there will be some degree of overlap. But where is the principle we start out with? And how do we navigate those things and say this is okay and this is not okay? And where do we start from in terms of the principles that, that we need to, to navigate this issue? And I think this book is particularly important for those people who are living in the West or li- let's say living in non-Muslim countries or countries with a large non-Muslim population. Because whenever you mix with the people and you live among them, by default you are going to pick up from their habits and their behavior and their characteristics, things that Islam prohibits you to have or strongly dislikes for you to have. So it's really important that we understand this topic as best as we possibly can. I'm just going to read you the, the opening couple of paragraphs just to get a feeling for how the book is being laid out. Sheikh al-Islam, he said, Rahimahullahu ta'ala, after Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi ladhi akmala lana deenana wa atamma alayna ni'matahu wa radhiya lana al-islam deena وأمرنا أن نستهديه صراط صراطه المستقيم صراط الذين أنعم عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم اليهود ولا الضالين النصارى. So the Sheikh begins with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I think by now you guys have heard the explanation of the Basmala many times, but we just zoom very quickly over it. The ba is ba al-istiana, 
asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help for what you're about to do. And starting with Bismillah is a sunnah from the sunan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he began every surah of the Quran except surah At-Tawbah with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. As a fa'idah, why did he not start surah At-Tawbah with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? The punishment of Allah, okay. Very good, we're definitely getting there. So tr directed towards the kuffar <coughs> and how they would be treated in the case of war. Nah. Allah was angry with them. Okay, very good. Sahih, like after that, Jibreel revised the Quran with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he didn't bring Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Because it's to do, it's a declaration of war. And a declaration of war is directly opposite to the concept of Rahma. Any when you want to declare war upon someone, say any the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows that mercy. That's what a shaltibi and he mentions in Hirz al Amani, Li Tanzi liha bisafi lesta mubasmila. Because it came down with the sword. And it came down as a declaration of war. That's what some of them said, and there are many aqwal in the mas'ala, ala kulli hal, the Prophet وسلم, and this is the only surah that doesn't begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and as you said, correctly said, that some of them attached it to Surah Al-Anfal. <coughs> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began every surah of the Quran except Surah Al-Tawbah with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the letters that he dictated to the kings and so on. He began with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And it's an ayah, or it's within an ayah of the Quran, innahu min Sulaiman wa innahu bismillahi rahman rahim And some of the ulama considered the first ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha to be bismillahi rahman rahim So it's, no doubt it's part of an ayah of the Quran, innahu min Sulaiman wa innahu bismillahi rahman rahim It came from Sulaiman with the title Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Seeking Allah's help by the barakah of Allah's names. Here the word ism is general in Ejinsul Asma, all of Allah's names. We single out three names to mention. <coughs> we single out three names to mention. They are Allah, who the meaning of which is Dhul Uruhiyah. The one who has the right, the one who has all of the divine attributes and the right to be worshipped alone. That's the meaning of the name Allah. And as for Ar Rahman, the pattern Fa'lan, the Arabs, when they use this pattern in the Arabic language, it focuses on the attribute. And it's the one who has the attribute of mercy that is never separated from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he is the most merciful. As for Ar-Rahim, the pattern fa'il in the Arabic language is it focuses upon the one who does something, the action itself. So here Ar-Rahim, meaning Rahim, is the one who bestows that mercy upon whoever he wants from his creation. He, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has infinite, perfect mercy, nothing is absent from it. Not even the stones and the rocks and the trees, not even things that are not even alive. Every single thing is surrounded and within the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah bestows that mercy upon whoever he wants. So he gives it to the believers, what he doesn't give to those who do not believe. And he gave to his awliya, his beloved, what he didn't give to others. 
So in this, what is there? There's an ishara, an indication of asking Allah for that mercy. That, oh Allah, I ask you, the one whose mercy encompasses every single thing to bestow your special mercy. Rahmataka al khasa, your unique special mercy any upon me in this endeavor that I am starting with. And there's more to talk about here, but that is just an overview. And then the Shaykh, he says, all praise is due to Allah who completed our religion for us and completed his blessing upon us and was pleased for us as Islam, for us, or was pleased for us to have Islam as our religion. Here, the Shaykh is indicating in his opening speech the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, Al Yawma Akmeltu Lakum Dinakum wa Atmemtu Alaikum Ni'mati wa Raditu Lakum al Islam Adina. And you know the conversation that happened between Umar ibn al Khattab and one of the Jews when he said to him, There is an ayah in your book. If it came down upon us, group of Jews, we would have taken it as a day of Eid. We would have made a day of Eid just for this ayah. Umar said, I know where this ayah came down upon the Prophet ﷺ in his farewell hajj, the day of Arafah. Today I have completed your religion for you. And I have completed my favor upon you. And Islam is a ni'mah, right? Fadlan min Allahi wa ni'mah wallahu alimun hakim. It's a blessing from Allah, it's a ni'mah from Allah. It's a grace from Allah. It's not something you can get by right. And you, don't, you can't turn up and say, my, my father was a Muslim. I have a right to, to Islam. It's a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah knows best who to give that ni'mah to subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is pleased for us to have Islam as our religion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased for any other religion and there is no other religion that is acceptable to him. Inna deena inda Allah islam The only religion in the sight of Allah is Islam. وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَيْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ فَلَيْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Whoever wishes something other than Islam as their religion, it will never ever be accepted from them. And that person will be in the Akhirah from the losers. And this is, all of it is important. It's not, it, this statement is not random. This is the first point that you will need to know in order to go through the book. That you remember you keep this ayah Nasba aynayk in front of your eyes. Al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al islam adina. Nothing else is acceptable. There is no other way to get near to Allah except that. Through the religion of Islam and the sharia that Allah gave to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the way that he practiced this religion. Like Al Imam Malik said, so whatever was not religion on that day is not part of the religion today. <coughs> and Allah commanded us as the Shaykh says rahimahullah ta'ala to ask his guidance to the straight path to ask his guidance to the straight path that's the next point the Shaykh makes that we have been commanded to ask Allah in every raka'ah of our prayer ihdina sirat al mustaqim guide us to the straight path. Very briefly, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave the example. He said, Darab Allahu Mathalan Siratan Mustaqima. Allah gave you the example of the straight path so you understand what this path is. This straight path is described as a path. When you enter that path, there is a gate. And when you go through that gate, a caller cries out, O servants of Allah, stick to Allah's straight path and do not deviate. Don't go left, don't go right. By the way, the Prophet ﷺ described that path, Layluha kanaha riha. 
It's night, it's like it's day. No one deviates from it except that they are destroyed. So it's a clear path. When you enter that path, you go through the gate. And you imagine a gate and a long, straight, clear road. A caller cries out, O servants of Allah, stick upon Allah's straight path and do not deviate. Don't go left, don't go right. On either side of the path, there are walls. <coughs> and those walls have doorways in them. And the doorways have curtains hanging down from them. So can you imagine? You go through this gate. The path is absolutely straight. It's not a windy road. It's completely straight and clear. On both sides of this road, there are walls. And the walls have doorways in them. The doorways have curtains hanging down over the doorway like a door. Whenever a person comes near to that curtain, a caller cries out that, O oh, servant of Allah, do not lift it. Don't open it up. Because if you open it up, you will surely go inside. Then the Prophet ﷺ explained that this is Allah's straight path, that the walls are the limits of Allah. The doorways lead to what Allah prohibited, the haram. The caller that cries out when you enter the path is the book of Allah. And the caller that cries out as you're about to lift the curtain, it is the wa'idh, the, the admonishment that exists in the heart of every single Muslim. And you have in your heart like an alarm bell. When you come close to the haram, it tells you, Ya Abdullah, don't, la taftah, don't open it. If you're going to open it, you are going to go inside. Like in some people listen to that and so they become sensitive to it and other people don't listen to it and so they become desensitized like the person who switches their alarm off every morning and they don't listen, they just switch it off, switch it off, switch it off. They become desensitized to that wa'idh, that warner, that warning system in your heart. And other people develop that warning system through beneficial knowledge and study. So they are more in tune with what is prohibited and less likely to fall into it. So Allah required us to follow this path. And Allah described who is on it. Sirat al an'ama alayhim. It is the path that Allah blessed. The people that Allah blessed them, He gave His favor upon them. And as we said in Surah An Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us who those people are. That they're the prophets, those who are the most truthful in their iman, the martyrs, and the righteous. And there's no doubt that if we want to look at that a slightly different way, the prophets and the sahaba, yani, no doubt are the, from the, yani, the prophets are the most deserving of the people to find on that path, and the sahaba of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who were the siddiqeen and the shuhada and the salihin that Allah praised their truthfulness in faith and Allah Azza wa Jal praised what they gave up for Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised their righteousness that he didn't praise for anyone else and you and me we don't know whether Allah considers us to be righteous or not we don't know whether Allah has accepted our deeds or not we hope and we also fear for our shortcomings like in those Sahaba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, Radiyallahu anhum wa radu an. Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Him. And Allah told us, Wakullam wa'ad Allahu al husna. All of them Allah promised paradise. And many, many other ayat. Fa in amanu bi mithlima amantum bihi faqadih tadaw. Wa in tawallaw fa in namahum fi shikaq. That. If you believe as these Sahaba believe, you'll be rightly guided. And if you turn away, you'll be in opposition to the Prophet ﷺ and opposition to the religion of Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ from some of the times that he was upon the mountain of Uhud, and he said, be quiet or Uhud, be still. There is only upon you a Prophet 
أنا صديق and two martyrs يعني meaning أبو بكر الصديق and يعني عمر and عثمان and in some of the narrations that mention different situations as well علي بن أبي طالب رضي الله تعالى عنهم for they are the most deserving of the people to be on that path right so you know you're on the straight path when you find yourself in it in those two descriptions. What do I mean? The description of the straight path, Tarab Allahu Mathal and Sirat and Mustaqima. When you find yourself on that straight path, you don't find yourself going left and right. You find yourself listening to the warning signs when you're about to fall into something haram. And when you find yourself following the footsteps of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophets Alayhim Salatu Wasallam and you find yourself following the footsteps of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and the righteous people that followed them so now you are walking upon that straight path how do we know that? because that's what Allah said sirat al-ladheena an'amta alayhim this is the path of the people that you gave your ni'mah to and Allah told us who those people are and nabiyyeen what an excellent group of companions they are. Then the Shaykh he said, alayhim. We ask Allah, Allah commands us to ask Him not to make us from the people that Allah is angry with. And the Shaykh he said here, Al Yahud, and that is the tafsir of the Prophet. So it's not permissible for anyone. I yeah, need to go away from what the Prophet ﷺ said about it. They are the Yahud. But the question is, why are they the Yahud? And the answer is, because what is predominant for, from them is that they are people of knowledge. <coughs> Until today, any, many of them are very dedicated to learning their religion. I think there is a huge gap between what they know and what they do. As for the Nasara, until today, in the and the Shaykh he says, and Nasara, the Christians, until today, we see from them either worship upon ignorance, and a false type of monasticism, yani they became like monks. We never told them to do it. They invented it, they innovated it. And then if you look at what Allah just said in the ayah, after that, فَمَا رَعُوهَا حَقَّ رِعَيَتِهَا They brought two evils. Number one, they brought a bid'ah which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never sent down any sultan for. And that is that they cut themselves off from the world and they locked themselves in monasteries and they made it haram for themselves to marry and to wear nice clothes and own property and all of that. Then Allah says they didn't even do a good job of it. They didn't actually do what they were supposed to do. For what is apparent from them, I'm not saying they don't have any knowledge. They are, just like there are ignorant people from the Yahud who don't know their religion. There are also knowledgeable people from the Nasara. But what is predominant from them is that they worship Allah upon ignorance. And even now, any if you were to look at the the rules and regulations, just as a faida, any as a benefit, look at the rules and regulations of the Jews and Christians. What do you see about the rules of the Jews? They have many, many strict rules, right? What they can eat and they can't, and what they can do and what they can't, and that's a sign of what ilm, right? There's knowledge. There's knowledge there about. Whether it be invented, whether it be lies, whether it be practiced, but there's there's a lot of rules about what they can and can't do. As for the Nasara, <clears throat> apart from basic human values like don't murder people, they actually don't have a religion at all. And every time I say that, I, I, I mean, usually I get some feedback that I upset some Christians, and I mean, it doesn't bother me at all because that's the truth. It is, wallahi. There's no deen. Ask them, tell me other than basic human values. 
like don't murder people and don't steal people's property. I want to know what do you people actually have that is not allowed or that you have to do. Wallahi, some of them even said, even belief in Isa is not a strict prerequisite of becoming a Christian. Wallahi, what is left? And it, you're called Christians. And there's nothing, nothing left. There's nothing you're not allowed to do. There's nothing you have to do. There's no prayer you have to do. There's no, nothing. Yani. Some of them might say you have to go to church once a week, but many of them, not even that. There's nothing that takes them out of their religion. Ask by what can a person leave your religion? Yani what is it that causes a person to leave your religion? Very little. So the point is that what is predominant from them is misguidance not knowing their religion properly not having rules of what to do and not to do so when we ask Allah to keep us away from these people <coughs> when we ask Allah to keep us away from these people what we are actually asking for is <coughs> beneficial knowledge and righteous action give us knowledge that we benefit from, don't make us ignorant. And allow us to practice that knowledge. And that is why ever since the Prophet ﷺ came with this final message, confirming the message that came before, Ahlul Kitab have not ceased to be jealous of what the Muslims have. Al-ilm al-nafi' wal-amal al-salih. Beneficial knowledge, and righteous actions and here what the shaykh is saying is if every raka'ah of the prayer you are asking Allah do not make me from those people then what is that what is the essential concept that we take from it being different from these people in every possible way that we can be different from them and I also want you to bear in mind, because there's a lot of discussion in these days, no doubt, about the Yahud and, and what is going on in Palestine. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring victory to the Muslims and to honor Islam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save our brothers and sisters that are suffering in Palestine and elsewhere in the world. Like, and when you hear that, Ikhwani, there is something that is catastrophic for us here. Wallahi, it is a catastrophe for us. That there are people we feel so much in our heart, so much anger towards what the Yahud are doing and what they are being like. And yet, wallahi, we are walking behind them footstep by footstep in so many things. In our behavior, in our akhlaq, in our practices. Don't you find it strange that we, we raise our hands and say, Oh Allah, curse these people. Oh Allah, send your anger upon these people. Wallahi, a person doesn't see that maybe in many things, and this book will show you, Many things you're actually following what these people do. So many people are telling us, you know, be careful not to drink this drink and buy from this company and everything. Yani muqata'a, you need to cut off from them. Like, and there is a muqata'a which is before that, even. I'm not talking about the, I'm not going to get into the ruling of muqata'a and everything. Like, there's a muqata'a that is more deserving than even that. Before you stop buying their products and before you stop, there's something more than that. And that is to cut off from their behavior. To cut off from their at their attributes and their characteristics and the way they do things and the way they approach their religion. Well, life you can't cut off from that. I'll be honest with you, there's very little benefit in cutting off from any you know, buying something from them. If you're buying something greater than that, you're buying their akhlaq, their tasarrufat, their the way they t approach the deen. If you're purchasing this from them, that's far worse than a person who's purchasing a drink from them or any purchasing technology from them or something like that. But keep this in mind. Every single day we are asking Allah, don't make us like the Yahud and the Nasara. Don't make us like these people. So that means we have to separate ourselves from them completely. We have to be different from them. We have to cut off from everything that we are permitted in this religion that we can cut off from to make us and them separate completely and this is the purpose of the book that the sheikh he he brought
Then he said, وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَا إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَحْتَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَرْسَلَهُ بِالدِّينِ الْقَيِّمِ وَالْمِلَّةِ الْحَنِيفِيَّةِ وَجَعَلَهُ عَلَى شَرِيعَةٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْرِ وَأَمَرَهُ بِاتِّبَاعِهَا وَأَمَرَهُ بِأَنْ يَقُولْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِ أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعْنِي صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم تسليما وبعد He then bears witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم is the slave of Allah and his messenger He sent him with الدين القيم the upright religion the religion that every single thing in it is the best that it can be إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوم this Quran guides to everything that is upright and proper everything that is righteous ibadat aqaid akhlaq mu'amalat our religion is the best in every single one of them it is the best in aqaid it has the best aqidah which is far away from Yani the negligence of the Yahud and the exaggeration of the Nasara. And we're going to hear from Shaykh al Islam that these two, both of them, are called Ghulu fid Deen. Both of them in Islam are called extremism. You know, sometimes people blame you, right, for practicing your religion. They say, Ahi, stop being extreme. Wallah, you have every right, and the ayah will come. To say to them, I'm not the one who is extreme. Rather, you are the one who is extreme. Say, I'm the one who is extreme. I only go to Jumu'ah. Yes, only coming to the Jumu'ah prayer and leaving the five daily prayers is extremism. In the religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it like that. Because these people, Al-Yahud and Nasara, in some areas of their aqidah, they have extremism as in going too far. وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودِ Uzairun ibn Allah wa qalat al-Nasara al-Masih ibn Allah The Jews said Uzair is the son of Allah and the Christians said that Isa alayhim as-salatu was-salam is the son of Allah That's extremism and not practicing your religion and falling short is also extremism and they have this as well the Jews and Christians they have this also form of extremism So our religion came as a middle ummah وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى We've made you into a middle ummah. There's nothing extreme about our religion. There's nothing which is too much or too little. It's exactly right in aqeedah, in our ibadat. SubhanAllah, look at the extremism of the people who lock themselves in the monasteries. And then look at the extremism of the ones who don't even know where their local church is. They wouldn't know where their local church is if they walked into it. They don't know where it is. Wallahi, I say this because I came from a Christian background before I accepted Islam. And we were like that. If you ask me where's my local church, Wallahi al-Azim, I could not have told you where my local church was. Extremism. What do Muslims have? Pray five times a day but you can work. You can go out and وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا You're allowed to have your portion from the dunya. You can get married. You have your life in this world. But five times a day you pause your life. Wherever you are. You don't have to be in a synagogue, in a church. In a, and you pause your life to pray wherever you are. And if it can be in the masjid, that's the best place. And if not, جُعِلَتْ لِيَ الْأَرْضِ مَسْجِدًا وَطَهُورًا This whole earth has been placed as a place of prayer and a place of purification. Look at the balance of Islam in ibadat. In zakah, don't give. وَلَا تَجَعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ Don't make your hand tied to your neck and you don't give it anything out. And don't extend it. وَلَا تَبْسُطْهَا كُلَّ الْبَسْتِ Don't extend it out so you end up in a state of poverty. Islam came with a balance in ibadat. Islam came with a balance in mu'amalat. In the way that you behave towards other people. Like nikah. Wallah, if you want to see, yani, subhanallah, 
the exaggeration of Ahlul Kitab in Nikah, for example. So both the Jews and Christians made it impossible for certain people to get divorced. And if you read the articles about Jewish women, they cannot, they cannot, she's kal mu'allaqa, she's stuck. She cannot, unless the husband approves it, she cannot get a divorce forever and ever. The Christians in the first place, many of them said divorce is the biggest of the haram. And it's more than shirk and it's the, it's the biggest haram that they have. And all the, all the issue, they, they, they have these relationships where they don't get married for so long and then, so, then they get married after 40 years and then they can't get out of the marriage after that. It's ghulu, exaggeration in every aspect. Islam has such a beautiful balance in every single mu'amala, in our trade, riba. We're prohibited from it. We're prohibited from the issue of riba, whether it is a Muslim or a non-Muslim. Not like the Yahud who said, riba is haram between us, but we are allowed to take advantage of the people who are not from, from us. Islam never came with that. SubhanAllah, balance in mu'amalat. In akhlaq, Islam is balanced. Our manners and our behavior is balanced always. So this religion brought the best of everything. And it is al hanifiyah it is the religion of Ibrahim. مَا كَانَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ يَهُودِيًّا وَلَا نَصْرَانِيًّا Ibrahim was not a Jew or a Christian. What was he? وَلَكِنْ كَانَ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ He was a Hanif. And he used to incline towards the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and away from any kind of polytheism. And he was a Muslim, someone who submitted to Allah in Islam. He was not from the people who made a partner with Allah. Then Allah made the Prophet wasallam follow a particular sharia. <coughs> We're going to come to the ayat to talk about it as well. And he made for us a way that we are supposed to follow and not deviate from it. And he commanded the Prophet ﷺ to say, Say, this is my path I call to Allah upon insight, me and those who follow me. And then he asked Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to the Prophet Muhammad. ﷺ. Then he said, just explaining a bit about the book, فَإِنِّي كُنْتُ قَدْ نَهَيْتُ إِمَّا مُبْتَدِئًا أو مجيبا عن التشبه بالكفار في أعيادهم وأخبرت ببعض ما في ذلك من الأثر القديم والدلالة الشرعية وبينت بعض حكمة الشرع في مجانبة الكفار من الكتابيين والأميين وما جاءت به الشريعة من مخالفة أهل الكتاب والأعاجم He said I'd already explained that it is prohibited and he said imma mubtadi an aw mujiban and he what he means by that is either i and he had someone asked me a question and i answered it or i initially and he, in the first place explained that it is not permitted for you to resemble the disbelievers in their ayad their celebrations and i had already informed some of the narrations with regard to this, the evidences from the Sharia, ah, and the wisdom of Islamic legislation in keeping away from the disbelievers, whether they are from Ahlul Kitab or whether they are from the Ummiyin. So here we're not just talking about Ahlul Kitab, even though we started off, even the Ummiyin, and the people who don't know any the, the polytheists, the idol worshippers. And if you look at something, every Muslim community that lives near a group of non-Muslims, wallahi, they got affected by them. And if you look at, for example, India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, where there's a lot of Hindus in, in that region, not necessarily in those countries, but in that region there are, there's a lot of Hinduism. You see the Muslims affected by that. That's why you see so many shrines and so many 
any people and subhanallah from the ajaib that i saw is the muslim is that subhanallah the, the hindus will even go to the muslim uh, yani shrines the adriha and go there to pray and they'll worship anything and if you leave them for five minutes Allah, they'll worship anything these are people <laughs> Guys, I'm not lying to you. Wallah, if you go there, go, go. Wallah, go and see. When you, Wallah, you will see, you will see things that cannot be explained. I've told many times. I was many, many things I saw in India. I can from the things that always sticks in my mind is that taxi driver with the plastic idol on his car, and every time he goes over a bump, his his god falls down on the floor, and he picks it up. He puts it's got blue tack on the bottom, and he sticks it back on the dashboard, and he prays to it quickly. Does a quick prayer. And then he caught his driving the car, then he hits another pothole. Because it's India, right? There's a lot of holes in the road. And then it falls again. So he picks it up again and he sticks it on better. And then he prays to it and he says sorry to his God that fell down. Hey, wallah, it's... And there's... This person has been stripped of all logic and intellect. And he completely... If you looked at the bottom of the idol, maybe it says made in China or made in India. <laughs> The person has put it on the dash dashboard and he's praying. And when it falls down, he prays to it. Ali, how is that going to keep you safe? You are the one who is keeping it safe. And every time it falls down, you stick it on the, on the car again. It's not keeping you safe. You're the one trying to keep it safe. And then you're the one praying to it before you start to keep me safe on this journey. It can't keep itself safe. So this, even this, the Muslims you see in those areas, if you look at all those different places where places where there's a lot of Christians in Sham where you have a lot of Christian like a lot of Christians you see the Muslims got very badly affected by it they started to take on board their culture and their behaviors so for us it doesn't matter whether we're talking about Al-Kitab or we're talking about anyone else we're talking about being different from all of the people of Jahannam here it's very important to note just as a and, and this is something that everybody knows can, I want you to make a note of it because when you are speaking to people about Islam you will have Muslims that have a confusion about this is that they will not attribute disbelief to Ahlul Kitab that happens a lot yani it's, it's a mis they do but they do I'm, we're not saying they don't believe that they're dis they believe that they're Muslims like in what they believe is they believe that they are not yani because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala separates between the kitabiyin and the ummiyin, between the ahl kitab and between the <laughs> idol worshippers, they seem to think the ahl kitab are yani, something different. Yani. Many times, and we'll just give one evidence for it, Surah al bayina Just read Surah al bayina to them. لَمْ يَكُنِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا من أهل الكتاب والمشركين منفكين حتى تأتيهم البينة فالله سبحانه وتعالى described them as disbelievers and in the ayah قل يا أيها الكافرون Allah described all of them as disbelievers لقد كفر الذين قالوا إن الله ثالث ثلاثة disbelieved those people who said that Allah is one of three for there's many, many ayat in the Qur'an where Allah calls them disbelievers. But the easy one is Surah Al-Bayyina, just to make it easy for everybody, because most of you will have memorized the Surah. So it's easy for you to show to somebody when they have this misconception. Why are Ahlul Kitab separated? It's not because they're not disbelievers. Ahlul Kitab are separated because they have a tradition, a prophetic tradition. They have prophets, they believe in. They have kutub, scripture they believe in. So these are a people who it should be easier to reach them in terms of your da'wah. And Allah gave them a very special position in terms of among the disbelievers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them relatively closer than the idol worshippers. So for example, the permissibility of marrying their women and the permissibility of eating their, their food and so on. All of this is to make it easy for them to accept Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to say to them, قُلْ يَا أَهَلْ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ 
come to a word that is just between you and us. That we're not going to worship anyone except Allah and we're not going to make any partner with Him. And the ayat and he continues. So the point is that Ahlul Kitab are given that position not because they are Muslim. They're given that position because there is an opportunity to call them to something they already have a certain commonality with you. They believe in prophets and scripture. They believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all the mistakes they have in, in that. So it's relatively easier for you to reach out to them and to call them to worship Allah alone. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls them by that name. Ahlul Kitab. You are people of scripture. You are people who prophets were sent among you. And so that is a kind of establishing evidence against them to show them that prophets were sent among you. You people had prophets. You had scripture. You people are not ignorant. You know what you're supposed to be doing. In the first of the Ten Commandments that both Jews and Christians believe in. Hear, O Israel, that your God is one God. You have no God worthy of worship but Him. Where are the Jews and Christians in relation to this statement of theirs, which they read and they believe in, that the most fundamental command that they've ever been given is La ilaha illallah. But they are nowhere near La ilaha illallah. So Allah calls them because of that. And He calls them, you are people of a kitab. You are not ummiyin. You are not ignorant people. You are not unlettered. You are not people who used to worship statues and stones. You are people who knew the religion. So come and accept the religion of Islam. And the Shaykh he said, and what the Sharia brought. Yani fi hadi mujanabatil kuffar. In the guidance of how to be separate and different from the kuffar. And here the Shaykh he says, Mukhalafatu ahlil kitabi wal a'ajim. Being different from ahlul kitab. And when he says the a'ajim, what he means here. In the ajam, the original word is the opposite of the Arab, right? But what he means here is, he means the other religions, that came, the other foreign religions. He like the idol worshippers and Hinduism and all these other religions that came, Buddhism and all of that. And the Sharia came with opposition to all of them. And that's the exact opposite, by the way, to what some of the religions bring when they accept all religions. Right? So you get that, like, especially Hindus are like that, often Sikhs are like that. When you talk to them, they will just say, yeah, we believe in Islam. We also believe in our religion and we also believe in every other religion. Because every road, they say all the roads. There's a very nice actually example one of the brothers gave in Da'wah. Wallahi, his response, Ajabani, to be honest, I was amazed by it. There was a Hindu man, and we were talking in a Da'wah situation, and the Hindu man said, look, I believe in Islam already. You don't need to convert me. <coughs> I believe in Islam. I believe that every religion leads to... Is that for a break or for the end of the class? I was going to say, Sheikh, that cannot be the end of the class. Uh, he said, I believe in, in your religion firmly. I believe in it. And I, I also believe in Christianity and I also believe in Judaism and I believe in Hinduism and Sikhism and... <coughs> I believe all of them are roads that lead to the same place. And we were in Dubai at that time. He said, you see how this building we're in, this office building has many roads. It's like that. So the brother gave an answer, Wallahi bi tawfiqillahi azza wa jal. He said, what do you think if the ruler of Dubai closed all the roads except one? What road would you take? And you said to me, I could have come to this office on this road or this road or this road. Like if the government closed all of the roads, the Hakim closed all the roads except one, which road would you take? He said, well, I have to take the road that the ruler opened. He said, and the ruler of the heavens and the earth has closed all the roads except Islam. Father Jawab, yani, it's a good answer. Yani. He's, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has closed those doors. Yani, Inna deena inda Allah, al-Islam. Sheikh Mertheimin mentioned an important point here. 
It's a fa'ida, to be honest. He said, مُجَانَبَةُ الْكُفَّارِ مُطْلَقًا غَيْرُ مَشْرُوعًا this is hard what did he say he said completely distancing yourself from the non-muslims is not part of our religion what does he mean here i'll read you the second part of the sentence but i want you to tell me what did you understand from that sentence a bit we've just been talking about how the whole religion is about being different from them and sheikh Taymin comes and says it's not mashru to be completely separate from them uh go on how are you Very good. So it's an issue of, he said, The person mixes with them to call them to Allah. Now it doesn't mean we go to their places that we're not going to the New Year's Eve celebration to call them to Allah. We're not going to the places of fasad. Like, and we're not also cutting off from them like to the point where we don't speak to them or we don't look at them. Now we, we, we are calling them to Allah. That is what is required from us with regard to these people. Shaykh al-Islam, he said, Rahimahullah ta'ala, وَإِن كَانَتْ هَذِهِ قَاعِدَةً عَظِيمَةً مِنْ قَوَاعِدِ الشَّرِيعَةً كَثِيرَةُ الشُّعَبِ أَصْلًا جَامِعًا مِنْ أُصُولِهَا كَثِيرُ الفروع. He said, this is a great principle, and being different from the non-Muslims, is a qa'idah. We understand the difference between a qa'idah and between a, let's say, a hukum. What's the difference between a principle and a ruling? Um, principle is something that you can utilize to get through the ruling, whereas a ruling is like a hukum, like if something is, you have that as an actual ruling, but what's the one you said? A principle, a qaida, yeah. That's something that you do to get that ruling. You can use it, to, it's a stepping stone to the ruling. Jade, there's one more important point we have to make. Very good. The qaida doesn't change. The qaida is a qaida kulliya. It doesn't change any. It's, it's a universal principle. But there's something else as well. How many issues can you use a principle for? Many. So a principle can be used for many, many issues. Whereas a hukum, a ruling, is used for one particular issue. So I get a ruling, for example, this is haram, or this is recommended, or this is obligatory, that benefits me in one specific aspect. Like in the qa'idah benefits me in everything, and in many aspects, and it can be applied in many areas. So it's a qa'idah in our sharia. The qa'idah is mukhalafatu ashab al jahim being different from the people of the hellfire. And he said kathiratu shu'ab, it has many branches to it. So he's not going to use it for just one issue. Wallahi, something he says later on, it amazed me, Wallahi, it really did. He was talking about, for example, issues in the da'wah between people and like people being jealous of other people in da'wah. He said, this is from Ahlul Kitab. Ahlul Kitab are the people who are known for being, yani, not facilitating each other's da'wah. And this one tries to stop this one, and this one tries to stop this one. But it's, there's many issues. It's not like just the issue of Christmas. and it's, There's literally hundreds. And, and I would honestly invite you that the principle of the book is every single thing that is mentioned about Ahlul Kitab in the Quran is mentioned for you to be different from them. Every story of Musa and Isa and the prophets of Bani Israel and what those people fell into going against their prophets, this is all there for the purpose of you to do the opposite. وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَنْ تَذْبَحُوا بَقَرَةً Allah commands you to slaughter a, a cow. Any cow. Just go find a cow. Bismillah. Put the cow down. Take a sh nice sharp knife. Bismillah. Allahu Akbar. Khas. Finished. What did they do? قَالُوا أَتَتَّخِذُنَا هُزُوَا Are you making fun? قَالَ عَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ أَنَا كُنَ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ I seek refuge from being from the ignorant. Go slaughter a cow. Ask Allah what type of cow? لَا فَارِدٌ وَلَا بِكْرٌ عَوَانٌ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ Not an old cow, not a young cow. فَفَعَلُوا مَا تُؤْمَرُونَ Now go and slaughter a cow. 
What color? Yeah, Safra. Faqi'u lawnuha. Pure yellow. Tasurru nadhirin. Now go find a cow and slaughter the cow that is yellow. It's neither young nor old. Inna al-baqara tashabaha alayna. They all look the same to us. Look at the inad. Look at the stubbornness and the refusal to accept what? And we Muslims become like that. We also became like that. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you to do something and you're trying to find like loopholes in it, ways through it. And you're sat there telling, mm, yeah, but what about if it's, but you know, if I only did it for this reason, go and do what you have been told. That's the, one of the things, if you want to know one thing that made the Sahaba, wallahi, better than anyone else. After the prophets and messengers, alayhim salatu wassalam, is this one thing, it's one of the things, it's this. That the Sahaba, they instantly did what they were told. Wallahi, to the point you hear ajaib. From the ajaib is that one time some of the Sahaba were outside of the masjid of the Prophet wasallam, And the Prophet وسلم, was inside the masjid. And they heard him say, Ijlisu, sit down. For Wallahi, they sat in the sand. He heard them say to some other people inside the masjid, Sit down. The words sit down wherever they were. Whoever was in the sand, whoever was on the road that heard the word sit down, they sat in their place and they don't move. Not They will not move. I'm sat. I heard the Prophet ﷺ say some words. Straight away they implemented it. Every single story is there for you to be different to how those people were. And it's an asl and jami'an from the usul so this is the difference like we said between the usul and any between for example usul al fiqh and between uh, al furu' is that we're talking about a, the, a, a general principle that can be applied or a general evidence that can be applied to many different situations rather than a specific situation so here the sheikh is not just going to say don't celebrate christmas like and he's going to give you principle that you can use in hundreds of different aspects of your life. And it's a good place for us to stop. Hada wallahu alam. Wa salatu wa salam ala bina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbi ajma'in. Only a break. Ikhwani, we need to come back, huh? Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. Inshallah, we'll take a break till uh, till five past, inshallah. We'll continue at five past. Uh, the books will be sold, so anyone who wants to buy the books, same place as yesterday, inshallah. The doors uh, on the side at the back.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We're gonna resume inshallah. So I request everyone to come and sit back down. Zakallah khair. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala abdillahi wa rasulih Nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in amma ba'd Sheikh he said rahimahullah ta'ala Thumma balagani bi akhara Anna minan nasi man istagraba thalik wa istabada Limukhalafati aadatin qad nashau alayha وتمسكوا في ذلك بعمومات وإطلاقات اعتمدوا عليها. So he said, it reached me recently that there are people who find this strange. And the idea that we have to be different from the non-Muslims. They find it very strange and unusual. And what they did is, <coughs> the reason, <coughs> the Sheikh brings two reasons why they find it strange, why they don't accept it. Why are there people who don't agree to this principle that we have to be different from the kuffar? The sheikh is to give two reasons. The first is They've got customs and habits that they've grown up with and those customs and habits have influenced them. <coughs> That's why if you go to someone in the UK and you say certain things to them. For example, Sheikh Muthaymin, from the points he mentioned, is that we should not use and it's the view of Sheikh Muthaymin. We should not use the Western calendar. That's the view of the Sheikh. And we should that using the Western calendar is agreeing with the kuffar for no reason. Why should we use a? We have our own calendar, which came from the Khulafa Rashidin, and from Khalifa Rashid, from Umar radiAllahu an. Some of them said there's no harm in mentioning it along with it, but why? And if you say that to someone, istagrabu dalik, and they're like, what are you talking about? You're telling me to like not use the Western calendar? Why? لِمُخَالَفَةِ عَادَةٍ قَدْ نَشَأُوا عَلَيْهَا They're used to it, right? They became used to what the non-Muslims use. They became used to it. Now we're not going into the ruling of it. Is it is it allowed to use or is it not allowed to use? That's it. We, this all discussion is coming, inshallah ta'ala. But the issue here is just that, for example, in Saudi, they don't find it strange when you say to somebody, you should not use the Western calendar. Like, don't use it primarily. Use the Hijri calendar and just mention the Western calendar as a, you know, in brackets. Because it's our, we have our own calendar. We're not, <coughs> and we're not from these people. They don't find it strange because it's their adah, it's their habits. Like in someone who spent their whole life organizing their time and their everything by the Western Gregorian calendar, yeah, the person is like, what are you talking about telling me to leave the calendar? This is the first thing. The second is umumat. They took some general verses of the Quran or general statements of the Prophet wasallam, and they misunderstood them. He said, فَاقْضَضَانِ بَعْضُ أَصْحَابِي أَنْ أُعَلِّكَ أَنْ أُعَلِّقَ فِي ذَلِكَ مَا يَكُونُ فِيهِ إِشَارَةً إِلَىٰ أَصْلِ هَذِهِ الْمَسْأَلَةِ لِكَثْرَةِ فَائِدَتِهَا وَعُمُومِ الْمَنْفَعَةِ بِهَا <coughs> وَلِمَا قَدْ عَمَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْإِبْتِلَاءِ بِذَلِكَ حَتَّى صَارُوا فِي نَوْعِ جَاهِلِيَّةِ He said, so some of my companions requested me to comment on this in a more general way. And in other words, the Sheikh told them, don't celebrate the Eid, don't celebrate Christmas, etc. And you don't celebrate these things. And some of the people, and they found it very strange. Like, what are you telling us? What is this you're telling us to do? So some of the students of the Sheikh, they said, why don't you write a more general book that covers all of these issues rather than just mentioning one issue. 
and there's a lot of benefits in it. It's something that is used across the board, and many people have been have fallen into trials and tribulations because of following or being affected by the habits and behaviors of the non-Muslims. And they became in a type of jahiliyyah. Now, wallahi wa Shaykh al-Islam, one of the things I really want you to benefit from Shaykh al-Islam, rahimahullah ta'ala, is a diqqa fil alfaf. He's very precise in what he says. He doesn't use like, he said, no jahiliya. He didn't say they're in jahiliya, they become kuffar. They are, you know, he said they have started to have an aspect of the time before Islam. He said, Bellem Akun Avunu, Annaman Wakar al Imanu fi Kalbihi Wakarasa Ilehi Hakika to Islam Annahu Dinu Allah, a lady la Yakbalu min Ahad in Siwa, either Nubbiha ala Hadi in Nukta, Illa can at Haya to Kalbihi, was Hiha to Imanihi, Tujibu. استيقاظه بأسرع تنبيه ولكن نعوذ بالله من رين القلوب وهوى النفوس اللذين يصدان عن معرفة الحق واتباعه He said rather I don't think that anyone who iman is established in their heart and anyone who has understood the reality of Islam that it is Allah's religion that he does not accept any other religion except it. That when they are told about this issue, the life that is in their heart and their iman will wake them up in the shortest space of time. So what is he saying? He's saying that a person of iman and a person who understands that Islam is the religion of truth, when you point this out, maybe they weren't aware of it, but once you point it out to them, very quickly they're like, yeah, that's true. We understood. But he said, I seek refuge with Allah from Rain al Qulub. The marks over the heart, the sealing or the covering of the heart. Their hearts have been covered up because of what they used to do. And the Hawa, <coughs> the person's desires, which are the two things that take away people from knowing the truth and following it. The, the kalam of Shaykh al-Islam is mali' bil fawaid. It's full of benefits. Because he's a great scholar and he brings many, many benefits. So he's telling you there are two things that stop people following the truth. One is sins that stop the tawfiq of Allah. Yani Allah doesn't give his success to the people to be able to to be able to follow the guidance and the desires of their souls. <coughs> and these are two things that stop a person from knowing the truth and following it. And a person is stopped from knowing the truth by a shahawat or shubuhat, right? That's another point you can take from غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالي and in reality, the Yahud, what they brought more than anything is shubuhat. In other words, confusion about what's right and wrong. And, and he, like they brought, uh, sorry, the Yahud, what they brought shahawat. The Nasara, they brought shubuhat. The Yahud, they brought shahawat. And they knew what was right and wrong, but they followed their desires. The Nasara, they brought shubuhat. They got themselves confused about what's right and what's wrong, and they got themselves mixed up. The sins that cover the heart and the desires that is within the soul, this stops a person from following the truth. Otherwise, as soon as you explain in a very basic way the Sirat al Mustaqim, straight away a person should be, yeah, I completely agree that we should be different from these people. <coughs> then the Shaykh takes a fossil, and this is what we wanted to, to, to read from today a chapter. <coughs> And it's, it's inshallah, it's very beneficial. He said, "Ilam, أن الله سبحانه وتعالى بعث محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى الخلق على فترة من الرسل، وقد ما قاتل أهل الأرض 
عربهم وعجمهم إلا بقايا من أهل الكتاب ماتوا أو أكثرهم قبيل مبعث قبيل بعثته أو مبعثه والناس إذ ذاك أحد رجلين إما كتابي معتصم بكتاب وإما مبدل وإما مبدل منسوخ ودين دارس بعضه مجهول وبعضه متروك. He said you should know that Allah subhanahu wa taala sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the people when there had been a gap in prophets. So we need to understand that this is the the beginning of the discussion. That the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent after there was a gap between the prophets. Any many people had gone astray and most of the people that were holding on to the kitab for example were holding on to Isa most of them died before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent any very few of them like if you look at people like Waraka Ibn Nawfal Rahimahullah Ta'ala those people who had true the true following of Isa many of them died just before the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent there were two types of people. There was either a person holding on to scripture or there was a person that had replaced the religion of Allah with something else. And this, the religion that they were upon, some of it they just didn't know what it was and some of it they had deliberately, they had deliberately left. As for his statement, Mubaddal or Mubaddal Mansukh, either the person had changed the religion of Allah or the person was following a religion that had been abrogated. And the person was holding on to the scripture, and most of those people had died. So you had those people who had changed their religion and you had those people who were following that which was abrogated. Some of the religion was unknown and some of it had been abandoned. Meaning some people were, had fallen into ignorance. They didn't know what was right and wrong. And other people had abandoned what they knew to be right. He said, وَإِمَّا أُمِّيٌّ مِنْ عَرَبِيٍّ وَعَجَمِيٍّ He said, and there were two types of people. The first type is the one holding onto the scripture. And the one holding onto the scripture is of two types. The one holding onto the scripture is either they've replaced the religion with something else, so they're holding onto the wrong scripture, or their scripture has been abrogated. And the second type of person is an ummi, someone who is illiterate whether they were from the Arabs or from the foreigners. مُقْبِلٌ عَلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ مَسْتَحْسَنَةِ وَظَنَّ أَنَّهُ يَنْفَعُ مِنْ نَجْمٍ أَوْ وَثْنٍ أَوْ قَبْرٍ He said the person was doing what? What were these people doing, the Ummiyun? They would worship anything they thought would benefit them. They were worshipping stars and idols and timthal, yani tamathil. They were worshipping statues, they were worshipping whatever they could. The people were in extreme ignorance. They had things that they thought were knowledge, but they were ignorance, and they had actions that they thought were righteous, but they were actually corrupt. أن يحصل قليلا من العلم الموروث عن الأنبياء المتقدمين قد اشتبه عليهم حقه بباطله. He said the maximum you could have got from these people is that they had a little bit of knowledge from that which was passed down from the earlier any prophets, but they got mixed up between what was true from it and what was wrong. أو يشتغل بعمل القليل منه مشروع وأكثره مبتدع 
or they would become busy with deeds. A tiny amount of the, their deeds were good deeds, but most of it was innovated. And most of their deeds did not make them, did not make them more righteous. Until he said, فَهَدَ اللَّهُ النَّاسَ بِبَرَكَةِ نُبُوَّةِ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَبِمَا جَاءَ بِهِ مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَى هِدَايَةً جَلَّتْ عَنْ وَصْفِ الْوَاصِفِينَ وَفَاقَتْ مَعْرِفَةَ الْعَارِفِينَ He said then Allah guided the people with the blessings of the prophethood of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and the guidance and instruction that he brought a guidance that is so complete you cannot find a description to describe it and it is it exceeds any the knowledge of any person hatta hasala li ummatihi al mu'minin umuman and they فَلِلَّهِ الْحَمْدِ كَمَا يُحِبُّ رَبُّنَا وَيَرْضَى He said something amazing. Well, I was, I was amazed by it. I highlighted this paragraph. He said, our ummah, <clears throat> the ummah of Muhammad, the believers from them, in a general sense, and especially people of knowledge among them, they got beneficial knowledge and righteous action and um, yani vast manners and righteous practices that if you were to gather all of the benefits from the previous Uman, if you were to gather everything that all the previous nations had in knowledge and action, any the pure, not the, not we're not talking about what they invented, the true, the knowledge of Musa and Isa, the proper knowledge. If you were to gather all of it together, it's incomparable. And the amount of knowledge and righteous action that was brought by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu you cannot compare it. And if you gathered all the previous nations' knowledge and action, what we have in Islam is vastly more than what they had. You can't even put a percentage on it. So all praise and it is to Allah Azza wa Jal. The Shaykh then says, he said, وَدَلَائِلُ هَذَا وَشَوَاهِدُهُ لَيْسَ هَذَا this is important. You see this a lot in, in the books of Shaykh al-Islam. He said the evidence of this and the evidences, the principle, and the evidences for it, this is not the place for them. What does the Shaykh mean here? You hear many times says this is not the place. Meaning he's spoken about it elsewhere. You can find it in a... So if you ever hear Shaykh al-Islam say, that this is not the place, usually it means that elsewhere he's spoken about it. So somewhere else you can find he's spoken about the fact that if you were to gather all of the benefits of the previous religions and everything they had, the pure the knowledge that they had, it is insignificant in percentage compared to what we have within the religion of Islam. And that's from the virtue that Allah gave to the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, ثُمَّ أَنَّهُ سُبْحَانَ بَعَثَهُ بِدِينِ الْإِسْلَامِ أَلَّذِي هُوَ الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ وَفَرَضَ عَلَى الْخَلْقِ أَنْ يَسْأَلُوهُ هِدَايَتَهُ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ وَوَصَفَهُ بِأَنَّهُ صِرَاطُ بِأَنَّهُ صِرَاطُ الَّذِينَ أَنْ أَنْعَمَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّيقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ he said, then Allah Azza wa Jal sent the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi with the religion of Islam, which is the Sirat al-Mustaqim. And the religion of Islam is the Sirat al-Mustaqim. And Allah made it obligatory upon creation to ask him for it every day in their prayer. And Allah described it as the path 
of the people that he bestowed his favor upon from the prophets, those who are truthful in their iman, the martyrs and the righteous, and that it's not the path of those who Allah's anger is upon, and not the path of those who went astray. From the benefits the Shaykh mentions here, so you've understood that's like an introduction. And the Shaykh has told us how many people were tested by this, many people have gone astray with it, there's a lot of confusion around it. It's something people should know instinctively but have become distant from. Some of the things that the Shaykh is going to bring, and from the evidences, that Shaykh al Islam is going to bring, is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ لَا تَغْلُوا فِي دِينِكُمْ غَيْرَ الْحَقِّ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا أَهْوَاءَ قَوْمٍ قَدْ ضَلُّوا مِنْ قَبْلُ وَأَضَلُّوا كَثِيرًا وَضَلُوا عَنْ سَوَاءِ السَّبِيلِ This is the first evidence that Shaykh is going to bring. It's not the first evidence in the book, but it's the first one I chose to read to you. Say, O people of the book, do not go to extremes in your religion other than the truth. Do not follow the desires of a people who were misguided before. And they misguided many people. And they were misguided from the straight path. Type <clears throat> Sual. Who is this ayah talking about? Who are the misguided people in the ayah here? What's the apparent meaning of the ayah? And which group of, of, of Ahl Kitab? The Jews. This ayah came about the Yahud, Surah Al Ma'idah, ayah number 77. Nezalat fil Yahud. Don't exaggerate in your religion, and you don't go to an extreme by following the desires of these people. In Surah Al Nisa, ayah number 171. So in this Surah, Surah Al Ma'idah, what's the conclusion we have here? Here, the ghulu is taqsir is falling short and it's the extremism of falling short we call it ghulu tafrit the extremism of not doing what you're supposed to do in surah an nisa ayah 171 allah azza wa jalla said ya ahl al kitab la taghlu fi dinikum wa la taqulu ala allah illa al haqq inma al masih isa ibn maryam rasulullah wa kalimatuhu al ayah O people of the book, do not exaggerate with regard to your religion. Don't go to extremes. And don't say about Allah other than the truth. The Masih, Isa ibn Maryam, is the messenger of Allah and his word until the end of the ayah. So what kind of ghulu is this? We call it ghulu al-ifrat. It is the extremism of going too far. And both of them both of them are extremism in the religion. Allah calls both of them extremism. Al-Ifrat wa Tafrit. Going too far and falling short. Both of them Allah describes as extremism. The Shaykh he said, وَجِمَعُ ذَلِكَ أَنَّ كُفْرَ الْيَهُودِ أَصْلُهُ مِنْ جِهَةِ عَدَمِ الْعَمَلِ بِعِلْمِهِمْ فَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ الْحَقِّ وَلَا يَتَّبِعُونَهُ عَمَلًا he said the summary of this is what? That the disbelief of the Yahud, its origin, the origin of it is what? Not acting upon their knowledge. They know the truth, but they don't follow it up with actions or they don't follow it up with statements and actions. Look how precise Sheikh Islam is, by the way. Even he'll say, like some of them might not have followed it up with statements or some of them said statements, but not actions. He's very precise. But the issue is, knowledge is there, but the action is not following up. He said, وَكُفْرُ النَّصَارَ مِنْ جِهَةِ عَمَلِهِمْ بِلَا عِلْمِ The kufr of the Christians, it came because of their acting upon things they had no knowledge of. فَهُمْ يَجْتَهِدُونَ فِي أَصْنَافِ الْعِبَادَاتِ بِلَا شَرِيعَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَيَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَعْلَمُونَ these people are working hard to worship Allah with things that Allah never gave them any sharia for. And they say about Allah that which they do not know. He said, وَلِهَذَا كَانَ السَّلَفُ 
سفيان بن عيينة وغيره يقولون إن من إن من فسد من علمائنا ففيه شبه من اليهود ومن فسد من عبادنا ففيه شبه من النصارى الله أكبر. He said for this reason the Salaf, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, rahimahullah ta'ala and others, they used to say, if we have an alim in Islam who becomes corrupt, that is their resemblance is the resemblance of the Yahud. In a scholar who is corrupt through their knowledge and he teaches people the wrong thing, misguides people with their knowledge, this person resembles the Yahud. And the one who is corrupt from our worshippers, you know, the one who's doing all kinds of bid'ah in their worship and everything like that, this person, they resembled the Nasara. And it's the statement of Sufyan ibn Uyayna. If you have a scholar who is corrupt, you know, the person is a person of knowledge, and they corrupt the people through their knowledge, then this person resembles the Yahud. And if a person corrupts people through their yani, ibadah, they give them all kinds of ibadah, ma anzal Allahu biha min sultan, this person has a resemblance to the Christians. And then he brought the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi in the hadith of Sahihain from Abu Sa'id al Khudri, that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, You will certainly follow the way of the people before you. In every step they take, you're going to be behind them. Even if they entered the lizard's hole, you would enter it. What's the, the statement about the lizard's hole? The fa'ida from it is, it is makanun la makhraja minhu. That's what they say. There's no way out from it. And you saw the person get in and get stuck. And you said, well, let me go in and get stuck as well. That's the example that is given. They said, oh, messenger of Allah, do you mean the Jews and Christians? He said, who else? You're going to follow the ways of these people. This hadith is a is a critical hadith for our discussion. We cannot have this discussion without this hadith. Because this hadith tells us that we will certainly let It's emphasized twice with lam and then the noon at tawkid at the end. And it's double emphasized. You will certainly follow the ways of the Jews and the Christians before you. Every step they take, you're going to be there in their footsteps. Until he said in the hadith narrated by Al-Bukhari from Abi Hurairah radiyallahu an, that the Prophet sallallahu said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى تأخذ أمتي ما أخذ القرون شبرا بشبر ذراعا بذراع. The hour will not come until my ummah will take the ways of the previous nations, hand by hand and arm by arm. فقيل يا رسول الله كفارس والروم do you mean Faris and Rome, the Persians and the Byzantines? Qala Waman in Nasu illa ulaik. Who are people except them? Yani? Who, who else is there to follow? So he told us that there will be Fa'akhbara anahu sayakunu fi ummatihi mudahatu. Lil Yahudi wa Nasara wahum ahl kitab. He said he told us that if we gather these two hadith together that we as an ummah will resemble Ahlul Kitab and we as an ummah will resemble what he calls the, yani the foreign religions and yani the religions that have no connection to any revelation any, the, the religion of the Persians and the Romans, yani the idol worship that they were on before Christianity, the Byzantines. And yani we are going to follow this, these people. Then he brought a very important point. He said, The 
The Prophet ﷺ prohibited us from resembling these and these. Not just Ahl Kitab. We are prohibited from resembling Ahl Kitab and all of the foreign religions. He said, وَلَيْسَ هَذَا إِخْبَارًا عَنْ جَمِيعِ الْأُمَّةِ This is not a statement about everyone in the Ummah. بَلْ قَدْ تَوَاتَرَ عَنْهُ أَنَّهُ لَا تَزَالُ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْ أُمَّتِهِ ظَاهِرَةً عَلَى الْحَقِّ حَتَّى تَقُومَ السَّاعَةِ حَتَّى تَقُومَ السَّاعَةِ He said this is not the whole Ummah that will follow the way of the Jews and the Christians and the Persians and the Byzantines. Rather, it is reported by a vast number of people, there will always remain a group of people from my Ummah that is apparent victorious upon the truth until the hour comes. And the Prophet Sallallahu This Ummah will never come together upon misguidance. وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَزَالُ يَغْرِسُ فِي هَذَا الدِّينِ غَرْسًا يَسْتَعْمِلُهُمْ فِيهِ بِطَاعَتِهِ And Allah continues to bring about in this ummah to cause people to come about that Allah uses them for His obedience. We ask Allah Azza wa to make us from the people that Allah uses them for His obedience and to spread His religion. He said, فَعُلِمَ بِخَبَرِهِ الصِّدْقِ أنه في أمته قوم متمسكون بهديه الذي هو دين الإسلام محضا وقوم منحرفون إلى شعبة من شعب اليهود أو إلى شعبة من شعب النصارى. He said, so he told us that among his ummah are a people that are holding fast to his guidance, which is the religion of Islam, which is the sirat al mustaqim. And there are other people who have gone towards a shu'ba, a branch of what the Jews were upon, or a branch of what the Christians were upon. وَإِن كَانَ الرَّجُلُ لَا يَكْفُرُ بِكُلِّ انحراف. Wallahi, this, يعني Shaykh al-Islam, he is munsif jiddan. يعني. Even though he's criticizing these people, he still says, I'm not saying you're disbelievers. I'm not saying that just because you have a, a deviancy in a, an aspect of what the Jews and Christians, that you're a Jew or you're a Christian. I'm not saying such a thing. And a person doesn't necessarily disbelieve because of this, but they've got a shu'ba. Min shu'abi al-Yahud. They've got some aspect of what the Jews were upon, some aspect of what the Christians were upon. Bal qad la yafsuku ayda. Rather, the person might not even become fasiq because of this. Allah, you look at Shaykh Islam was the furthest of the people away from al ghuluf al takfir and tafsiq. And he declaring people to be kafir, left, right, and center, declaring people to be fasiq. He said maybe a person might fall into something from the Jews or Christians. He's not even doesn't even become a fasiq because of it. بَلْ قَدْ يَكُونُ الْإِنْحِرَافُ كُفْرًا وَقَدْ يَكُونُ فِسْقًا وَقَدْ يَكُونُ مَعْصِيَةً وَقَدْ يَكُونُ خَطَأً Wallahi, this should be written down as a principle in Aqeedah. This is very important. Wallahi, fi bab al-takfir. He brought, like, he just brings these gems out. Like, in the middle of a discussion, he brought that this inhiraf, this deviancy, comes under four categories. That which is kufr, that which is fisk, yani open defiance and disobedience of Allah. That which is sinful and that which is a mistake. And Shaykh Ibn, uh, Shaykh, uh, Ibn Uthaymeen, and he brought a very big faida benefit in commenting on this. How do we know? He said, he said, Al-inhiraf arba'atu aqsan. Deviancy is of four types. Kufrun wa fisq wa ma'asiyah wa khata. Disbelief and defiance. And you understand fisq. And to openly, clearly disobey Allah in front of all the people. Wa ma'asiyah, a regular sin. Wa khata, and a mistake. He said, In kana al-inhiraf yu'addi ila ridda sara kufra. If this inhiraf is from the things which leads a person to apostasy, it's kufr. 
And there's also a qaida Shaykh al-Islam brings as well. Not everyone who falls into kufr is kafir. You should also write this down. Not everybody who falls into kufr is kafir. He means rather a person could fall into kufr and there's a mani' min al-mawani' that stops us from calling them kafir and there's an obstacle to that. Like they had a shubha about it, confusion about it. But when you see like Shaykh al-Islam gets blamed by people, that he's very extreme, even some countries ban his books, don't teach his books. Wallah ta'ala ar-rajul munsif jiddan yani. It's extremely fair and extremely balanced and very, very, rather wallahi, sometimes if you read his refutation of the Rafidah even, even his refutation of the Shia, wallah you see insaf, yani ajib, yani how he, subhanAllah, will say this point could be, yani you might have a, this issue, yani you had the evidence for it. Any a person wants to go and just, you know, steamroll over these people. Like in Wallah, anything they said that has a, a wedge for it, it could be that you had an angle here, it could be that this thing that you said you understood, but this thing you said is completely false. And he, he doesn't and he oppress people when he speaks about them. Don't let hatred of a people stop you being just. Be just, this is closer to a taqwa. <coughs> So if this action is an action which is going to lead a person to apostasy, and apostasy is a well-known issue, right? It's in all the books of fiqh before. And again, if someone says, oh, you guys are extreme, you know, you to kafir nas you take people out of Islam. We say, is there any madhab from the madhahib of Islam that are well-known, the Hanafiya or the Malikiya or the Shafi'iya or the Hanabila, except that they have chapters in their madhab about ar-ridda, what makes a person leave Islam. And is there, there's, everybody believes there are things that take a person out of Islam. So if the person is copying the Yahud and Nasara in a way that the Quran and Sunnah declare that they have left Islam, then this resemblance of the Yahud and the Nasara is kufr. We may not declare that person to be kafir, depending on whether they have confusion over what they're doing, depending on whether they were forced or not forced. Many issues that we look at, but they committed an act of kufr. The Shaykh, he said, وَإِن كَانَ يُؤَدِّي إِلَىٰ خَرْمِ الْمُرُوءَ وَالدِّينَ لَا يَصِلُ إِلَىٰ الْكُفْرِ فَهُوَ فِسْقِ Shaykh Muhammad Sayyid If it is something which leads to a loss of you can say good, yani a loss of your proper Islamic behavior, or a weak, a severe weakness in the religion, then this is fisk. And not everyone who falls into fisk, we call them fasiq. Not everyone who falls, in, falls into fisk, we say to them, ya fasiq. Then he said, wa in kana duna dhalik fa huwa ma'asiyah. If it is less than that, it's sinful. And it's something that doesn't like rip apart at the religion, like it's something not allowed. Wa in kana natijan an ta'wilin lahu masagun fil lugha fa huwa khata. And if it came about because of an error, which there is a linguistic reason or a potential reason for falling into that mistake, it's considered to be a mistake. And here, Shaykh Mathaymin brought something, Wallahi, I think if the only took, thing you took from this conference is this one line, Wallahi, I think it's worth it. He said, وَيَصِحُ أَنْ يُوصَفُ الْخَطَأْ بِالْإِنْحِرَافِ وَلَا يَصِحْ أَنْ يُوصَفُ قَائِلَهُ, قائله بِأَنَّهُ مُنْحَرِفْ إِذَا عَلِمْنَا أَنَّهُ صَادِرٌ عَنْ اجْتِهَادٍ Allahu Akbar. He said, when a person makes a mistake out of ijtihad, they are qualified scholar and they make a mistake. The mistake, we call it deviancy, but we don't call the person who does it a deviant. And then he goes on to talk about the, the likes of the Imams of Islam who fell into muwafaqatu al-ashaira fi ba'di aqwalihi. They agreed with the ashaira in some issues that person was a sincere scholar. And that person made a mistake. 
the first thing we do is we describe that mistake as inhiraf. We say this mistake is a deviancy. We don't say it's permissible, it's a, it's a valid khilaf. We say this is inhiraf. But we don't call the person mubtadi' and we don't call them munharif. Why? Because it came from a mistake that resulted from ijtihad. And this is why, and it, this is in something that the, in Sheikh Muthaymin mentions extensively, this is why that you cannot describe the likes of Al-Hafid ibn Hajar and Al-Nawawi rahimahumullahu ta'ala as being munharifin. You cannot. This is a khata, it's a big mistake. What you say is, yes, that view about Allah's names and attributes that was brought, al half of this, you know, on and off about it, like sometimes he bring, he falls into it, sometimes he doesn't. Like that view is inhiraf. It's a wrong view and it's not correct and we don't tolerate it. Like the, the, the Sheikh is from the imma of this ummah. Sincere, bi idnillahi ta'ala. He made a mistake. He didn't go upon all the qawaid of the ashaira. He didn't hold taqdeem al-aqal al naql that the intellect takes precedence over the text. He didn't hold rad khabar al-wahid, yani refuting the, the ahad hadith. None of this. What he did is he made ijtihad in an issue about Allah's names and attributes for akhta. He made a mistake and he brought inhiraf in it. He brought misguidance in it. But he himself, we don't call him munharif, mubtadi' ash'ari. La wallahi. Because it's clear that this mistake came about from trying to reach the truth and making a mistake. But we still call it a mistake. So this is the wasatiyah. Some people say, don't call it a mistake. You can't say it's a mistake. We're all Ahl Sunnah, yani we're all together, all, yani we're all together, as, uh, yani all in the same boat. It's not like that, wallahi. It's not. We say it's a mistake. It's in Hiraf. But we don't describe. We don't describe the person who does it that they are mubtadi' or munharif. We say, akhta'a fi mas'ala. And sincerely, he made a mistake. Wallahi, this, if you could take what Shaykh Muthameen said and you apply that, much of the issues between the brothers and the kalam about various scholars, wallahi, it will just disappear in front of your eyes. Because you understood that there are two types of people. There is a person who they are munharif. They are a deviant. They themselves are upon a path of deviancy and misguidance. And there are others who are genuine, sincere people who got the sunnah in so many things. Like in akhta'a fi mas'ala. And he made a mistake and he was qualified. Because if he's not qualified, we don't say ijtihad. And if he, if he was not qualified to speak, we don't say he made ijtihad. And he was qualified to make ijtihad, but he made an error in that ijtihad. So this person, we describe the mistake as a mistake, and we call it misguidance, but we don't call the person misguided. <clears throat> I'm going to just quote, just finish off the, the topic, and it's just it's like one page left, and then we can continue uh, yani tomorrow. The Sheikh he said, وَهَذَا الْإِنْحِرَافِ أَمْرٌ تَتَخَاضَاهُ الطِّبَاعِ وَيُزَيِّنُهُ الشَّيْطَانِ فَلِذَلِكَ أُمِرَ الْعَبْدُ بِدَوَامِ دُعَاءِ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ بِالْهِدَايَةِ إِلَى الْإِسْتِقَامَةِ الَّتِي لَا يَهُودِيَةَ فِيهَا وَلَا نَصْرَانِيَةَ أَصْلًا He said these kind of mistakes, this inhiraf, is something which is natural. Any a person might naturally fall into it. And the shaitan decorates it and beautifies it for them. So this we are commanded to ask Allah constantly to guide us to the straight path which has no aspect of Judaism or Christianity in it at all. He said, وَأَنَا أُشِيرُ إِلَى بَعْضِ أُمُورِ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْأَعَاجِمِ أَلَّتِ بْتُولِئَتْ بِهَا هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ لِيَجْتَنِبَ الْمُسْلِمُ الْحَنِيفَ الْإِنْحِرَافِ عَنِ الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ إِلَى صِرَاطِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ أَوْ الضَّالِينَ He said, in this book, I'm going to show you some things that the people of the book and those of the foreign religions fell into and this ummah was affected by it. 
So he's going to bring in this book, it's two conditions, something that came from Ahl Kitab or foreign religion. And this Ummah has been tried with it. And people in this Ummah have fallen into it. Why? So that the Muslim who is Hanif can keep away from this kind of deviance from the straight path. And so they don't fall into the path of those that Allah is angry with or those that have gone astray. For Wallah, he look at the nasiha and he's saying, I'm not here to, I'm not here to, you know, to uh, attack you. I'm not here to, I need to have a go at you. I'm here to give you sincere advice so all of us can stay on the Sirat al Mustaqim and we don't end up on the path of those people by showing you things from the Quran and Sunnah that Ahlul Kitab or, or Faris or Rum did and that we as an Ummah have fallen into today. And I'm going to give you just one example just to finish the page, that's it. He said, قال الله سبحانه ود كثير من أهل الكتاب لو يردونكم من بعد إيمانكم كفارا حسدا من عندي أنفسهم من بعد ما تبين لهم الحق فذم اليهود على ما حسد المؤمنين على الهدى والعلم وقد يبتلى بعض المنتسبين إلى العلم وغيرهم بنوع من الحسد لمن هداه الله بعلم نافع وعمل صالح وهو خلق مذموم مطلقا وهو في هذا الموضع من أخلاق المغضوب عليهم والله the example he gives is والله shocking يعني of all the examples he brings he brings the ayah, many of the people of the book wish that you would turn back after your iman as disbelievers because of jealousy from them about the truth that has become clear to you. He said the Yahud were blamed for having jealousy towards the believers for the guidance and knowledge they were given. He said, and some of the people that attribute themselves to knowledge were affected by the same thing. I mean, some Muslims who are people of knowledge, were affected by the same thing and they attribute themselves to knowledge. They have a certain amount of jealousy for other people's knowledge or righteous actions. He said this is a blameworthy characteristic in every situation. And in this situation, they have followed some of the akhlaq of the Yahud. It's amazing how, look at the istimbat. How did he take that out from the ayah? Allah is ajib. How did he take from the ayah how does he go into the ayah and bring out this evidence that the Yahud were blamed for what? Having hasad for other people's knowledge and righteousness. And many people from the Tullab al-Ilm, Talabat al-Ilm, issues between them because of this. Problems between each other because of hasad over he's got a position or he's got a table or he's got students or more people came to his class than my class. Or why is it that this person has got righteous deeds that I don't have? What should be our perspective? We all race, we race each other. I see someone is teaching a book. MashaAllah, amazing this brother is teaching. Let me see, now let me study hard. Bi idnillahi ta'ala, I can bring a book for the people like that. Or perhaps, inshallah ta'ala, I can yani, take a step forward. And we, we race each other to Jannah. But not the hasad. Shaykh al-Islam has a definition of hasad, which we'll finish with, uh, which is very daqiq. It's actually better than the standard definition. The standard definition of hasad is tamanni zawal ni'ma yani an ghayrihi. It's for a person to wish for a blessing to be taken away. Shaykh al-Islam said it's not necessary for it to be like that. He said, "Man kariha ma an amallahu bihi ala ghayrihi faqad hasada." Whoever dislikes a blessing that has been given to someone else, they've been jealous of them. So it's not the case that you have to want that blessing to go. Just the fact that you dislike that somebody has a blessing, you see someone who's been given a blessing and you dislike it, you have taken a khuluq min akhlaq al yahud. And how many people from the students of knowledge and the teachers of Islam, people fell into this. Rather, sometimes people refute each other. Hasadan min indi anfusihim. Yani the only reason why they refute each other is because of hasad between each other. Why has he got students and why he's got knowledge and why he wrote this book and why was his published and mine wasn't? 
That's why the ulama speak about Jarhul Aqran, the criticism that happens among contemporaries. And generally they don't take it to account. And when two contemporaries, people that were together in the same class or studied together from the same sheikh, and they start having a go at each other, they start being like, you're a misguided individual, no, you're a misguided individual. Generally speaking, we don't give it any, any weight. Sometimes, but rarely we give it weight. Because this is hasadan min indi anfusihim. It's just something that happened between them on a personal level, and this one got jealous of this one, and then they started back and forward like that. For subhanAllah, his istimbat, how he took that out from the ayah, every single ayah that mentions something about Ahl Kitab or the Ummihin, there are people from the Muslims that fell into it. Uh, this Quran is not a storybook. It's not a book of stories to tell you so you can sit there and say, wow, it's so interesting what happened to Musa. It's because you're going to go down that path. So you have to keep away from it. This masail and ikhtilaf, any fatwa shopping. Like Bani Israel, who started fatwa shopping? Fatwa shopping was started by the Yahud. Until today, they, have, they, they are the, the experts in fatwa shopping. And if they don't like a verdict, they go to a different rabbi, get a different verdict. We became like that. And you don't let, and sometimes the people watch and they say, like, you know, from the Jews and Christians, and they say, why, you know, you're being really harsh with us. And like, I'm not being harsh with them. And what do you expect from them? I'm being harsh with the Muslims who follow that. And how can we follow that method of if you don't like what one said, Imam said, go to the different Imam until you get a fatwa that you like? It's a very dangerous way. If I just take that into account, inshallah ta'ala, uh, and I think that brings us to, and that brings us to the conclusion. We'll bring one more ayah, which is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, When Allah took the covenant from the people given the book, you will explain it to the people and do not conceal it. So concealing knowledge and this is also something that many, many people, he said, He described the people that Allah is angry with by the fact that they conceal their knowledge. He said, the people that Allah is angry with they were criticized in the Quran for what? What did Allah criticize the Yahud for? Concealing knowledge. Either out of stinginess, they don't want people to have it. I'm not going to give you, I'm not, I don't want to give you that knowledge. Or because it got in the way of their dunya. How many people concealed knowledge because it got in the way of their dunya? Many people, yani, subhanAllah, it got in the way of their dunya. Either because of the Kubara or the Umara, the Uzara, any positions in the dunya, it caused them to conceal knowledge. And we don't say that about Alhamdulillah, our ulama. We don't say that about them. And don't let don't let the Shaytan whisper in your ear that our mashaykh and our ulama conceal knowledge because of manasib, and so they can have a position. La wallahi, it's not like that. Had to even logically, if that happened to one person. La you tasawwur that the whole, or like that it happens to everybody, right? Not everybody has a position. Yani. For in the first place, the, the issue is it's impossible to think that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people that he chose uh, to, to guide this ummah after his guidance would all be on the take. Yani. Like and it's true, there are people who compromise their religion because of status. Not just from the not just from the umara, not just from the governments, but even from their own self, and yani your status in your tribe, in your family, in your and you have a position. And certain things people don't want to hear. Sometimes because of fear that people would use it against them as an evidence. And they concealed knowledge. And Sheikh Sheikh Al Islam actually brings this later on, that this actually happened in the Madahib. Yani this actually happened in the madhahib fiqhiyah. People concealed evidences because it would have weakened their madhab and it would have strengthened the other madhab. It's true. I'm not saying, again, we don't say our ulama were like that as a whole, but there were people within the madhahib who concealed 
evidences in order to that the person saw the person doesn't realize that the truth actually exists with another view and this is the sifat of the yahud and that's how the yahud were like so there's many points that the sheikh is going to mention like in this and he said for example wataratan i'tiyadan anhu bi ri'asatin aw malin and someone's worried about their money hatta the imam of the masjid yani it happens right how many times we've seen from imam al masajid that ya akhi look at look at the munkarat that's going on why why are you not saying something like even privately it's like oh, well these people you know my salary and everything you know it comes from these people i'm limited what i can do for this is something we fell into as an ummah alhamdulillah we didn't fall into it yani across the board like in we fell into it in places there were people who would not say the truth because of these things a person yani for example he said aw yataza ila ta'ifatin qad khulifat fi mas'alah fayaktum min al-'ilm ma fihi hujjatun li mukhalifihi wa in lam yatayaqqan anna mukhalifahu mubtil he someone hides an issue in 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 fiqh or aqeedah they hide an evidence because they don't want the people to realize that their position is wrong this is also min sifat al yahud <laughs> abd rahman ibn mahdi he said ahlu al ilm yaktubuna ma lahum wa ma alayhim wa ahlu al ahwa'i la yaktubuna illa ma lahum allahu akbar he said the people of knowledge write the evidences that are for them and the evidences that are against them any a person of knowledge knows what evidences they have and they also know what evidences the other people have and they're not shy to say you have this evidence my response is this but the people of desires only write what supports them that's why they say ahlus sunna yastadilluna thumma ya'taqidun ahl sunna first of all they bring the evidence then they take the aqeedah from the evidence wa ahl al bid'ah ya'taqiduna thumma yastadilun ahl al bid'ah first they have an aqeedah then they go looking for some evidence to support the belief that they have but it's extremely important to keep that in mind hadha wallahu alam wa salatu was salam ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in inshallah ta'ala we'll continue but I hope, like just by reading, we're not going to get through the whole book, but I hope that and you just get these gems that Sheikh Islam brings out. And you, can, you start to see yourself in all these things that we read in the Quran and Hadith. You're going to start yourself to see that, subhanAllah, we are actually following Ahl Kitab in many things that they did. And we have to separate from that. Wallahu alam. Um, Alhamdulillah with that we finished half of the Dora so far two days are gone and two days are left so as intense as it is time has gone really fast uh, Inshallah after Fajr uh, Shaykh Tim will be continuing uh, and the itinerary yeah, is the same structure as uh, as today Inshallah you will send, you know, we'll resend the itinerary so everyone can follow just a reminder for everyone please clean up your places wherever you're sat make sure you're not leaving anything um, also Brothers, if I can ask everyone to just uh, become silent for a little while, please. Also, some of the... Shh! Brothers. Right, uh, also, another complaint which is received is that uh, some brothers, you know, it's a bit embarrassing to say, but it's need to be said, which is that when they go to the bathroom, they, you know, cause a lot of mess there, which causes blockage. It causes, you know, a lot, a lot of issues. Some brothers are, when they're using, you know, toilet roll, they're just taking miles of toilet roll and it blocks the and so on so please you know all of these things I know uh, you know you, you probably don't do the same in your house so don't do you know don't do this in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right and also a reminder that inshallah within about half an hour we're going to turn off the lights so those who are sleeping over once the lights are off please no talking anyone who wants to talk go outside inshallah